I won't mislead you. This will not be a positive review of Scarlet and Violet. When Scarlet and Violet was announced in February of 2022, I was cautiously optimistic, as I typically am with new Pokemon games. The tight release schedule was already causing Pokemon fatigue, but the reveal trailer showed much more than I expected at that stage. The game seemed pretty far along in development, which was reassuring. We were riding high on the surprising and refreshing gameplay of Pokemon Legends Arceus, which suggested that maybe Game Freak was willing to try some interesting new things. There was a lot of hope that aspects of Legends Arceus would propagate through future main series titles, but among the earliest marketing copy for the games was a phrase that did the opposite of reassure me. You'll be able to experience the true joy of the Pokemon series, battling against wild Pokemon in order to catch them. Man, if the Pokemon company thinks battling Pokemon to catch them is the true joy of the Pokemon series, I don't think Pokemon understands Pokemon. That phrase was gone from the website by the next update, so maybe it was just some throwaway marketing copy that they realized wasn't as good as it could have been. Perhaps it didn't mean anything deeper. But Legends Arceus specifically innovated on catching mechanics and was widely praised. Stealth catching wild Pokemon was one of, if not the best, gameplay decision they made. So seeing the absence of that option touted as the true joy of Pokemon did not give me much confidence, so I was ambivalent, but I tried to go in with an open mind and an open heart. I love Pokemon. I wanted to love Scarlet and Violet, but the caution turned out to be more warranted than the optimism. If you want to know how I felt about the game as I was playing it, I have a series of daily gameplay journals. They're a good snapshot of my immediate impressions. Today, I will dive deep into the lasting impressions. Let's first talk about what everyone talked about first, the game's performance and its glitches. I'll admit that these did not hinder my enjoyment of the game as a whole. I didn't have a lot of slowdown. There were plenty of visual glitches from lighting errors to invisible characters, but relatively few that distracted me from the game. And I only had the game crash once, which was only in the post game. But that's not to say that I think the performance was satisfactory. This level of jank should not be acceptable for a major game in a major series published by a major company. If you can't get the game to run smoothly and reliably and look right on its native platform, you're doing something wrong. It's like publishing a book riddled with typos. Maybe it doesn't affect the story, but it significantly affects the experience of reading the story. But like I said, performance and glitches had a relatively small impact on my experience. A lot of other things irked me more. Some things used to be standard, but went missing, like being able to search in the Pokedex, or even scroll quickly through the Pokedex or the bag. Some things were added only months after the game's release, like being able to navigate and manage your boxes efficiently. Some things should have been there to facilitate new features, like saving custom sandwich recipes or filtering your recipes by meal power. Some features were present, but not consistently, like how the Pokemon summary screen only lets you change nicknames when the Pokemon is in your party, not in the box. And that's just all minor annoyances. Some things did significantly impact my game. The set battle style is gone. Usually in a trainer battle, whenever you defeat a Pokemon, the game tells you what Pokemon the opponent will send out next and prompts you to switch without costing you a turn. With set style, you wouldn't get that prompt. It was the closest thing to a difficulty option that Pokemon consistently offered, and for the past decade, it was the first thing I changed in the options. Now it's not there anymore, and the game wasn't adjusted in other ways to compensate for it. Shiny Pokemon in Scarlet and Violet have no visible sparkle effect in the overworld, or an audible chime. It makes it much harder to spot a shiny, especially one you're not actively looking for. Considering how tiny some Pokemon look in the overworld, and how minimalistic some of the shinies of this generation are, a sparkle effect, visible or audible, but ideally both, would have been an enormous help. And frankly, it would have given me peace of mind that I didn't miss a shiny. Main series Pokemon games are pretty shitty when it comes to accessibility, but it's wild that the most significant step they made in accessibility this time was to remove a helpful feature. 
Character customization in Scarlet and Violet is awful. Character customization does not need to be extensive to be effective. It doesn't even need to be in the game. But modern Pokemon games ask you to project a character into that little avatar you control. Whether you project yourself or someone else, that doesn't matter, but recent games have done no work to give personality to the main character. That's entirely up to the player. Previous games have supported that in different ways, like Sword and Shield offering a fantastic array of clothes, including many I wish I could buy for real. Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl only offered set outfits, but those felt unique, interesting, and varied enough that you could find one or more that you liked. At least for the girls, the guys didn't get anything good. Scarlet and Violet did make some exciting advancements in this. They offered surprisingly fine control over facial features. I even gave my characters a prominent mole below the right eye. And there are no gender exclusive options like there used to be for hair and clothes. This is fantastic and needs to not just become standard, but be expanded. In compensation, however, the clothing options are atrocious. For most of the game, there are only four uniform options. I never had to wear a school uniform outside of sporting events, and I'm against school uniforms in principle, but I'll save that for a different video. The problem is that the uniform dominates your outfit, so you get the least variety in the most impactful clothing choice you can make. Sure, you can accessorize at will, but why do I need 14 different glove styles when the glove is five pixels on my screen? Why do they need to differentiate between fingerless gloves and fingerless mittens? Why are there 38 color variations for trainer gloves? Ultimately, your best options for self-expression are hair, where you do have a lot of great options, a backpack, although I never found something that I really liked, a hat or helmet if you wanted to wear one, which I didn't, or tights as long as you're okay with the way they pair with shorts, which can look okay depending on the combination, but it sure would look a lot better if I could be wearing a skirt. And on top of that, because no, I'm not done ranting about the customization options, even though you can choose how thick your frickin' lips are, you are still restricted to being a 12-year-old child in a game that explicitly explores lifelong learning. Some student trainers are much older than the average student, much younger, more heavyset, or they have a beard, so why are none of these options available to the player? Mm. What was next? Oh, right, VGC onboarding. This is something that makes me more bummed than frustrated. One of the few things that Sword and Shield did well was giving me the resources to participate in competitive battles. It didn't teach me much about VGC, but I liked that you visited the battle tower at the end of the game. You get a bit of story dialogue with Leon there, which gives you a small incentive to try it out. But more importantly, in this one place, you can buy mints, some TMs, and most of the relevant hold items. You can get the battle ready mark, do hyper training, rent pre-built teams, and of course, you can take on the battle tower, which gets you some beginner experience in the format, and gets you started collecting the battle points you need to get more items. Except for TRs and a few other things that were added in the Isle of Armor and Crown Tundra, the Battle Tower was a one-stop shop for almost everything you needed for competitive battles. It was incredibly helpful to me as a VGC beginner who had only competed in online tournaments to earn the shiny Pokemon participation prizes during Gen 7. In the Sword and Shield era, I played on the Ranked Battles ladder for several months and entered a few online tournaments, which I don't think I would have without the Battle Tower. Scarlet and Violet doesn't have an equivalent. It was great that you could buy most items with cash or league points, so you didn't have to earn BP before you could even start building your perfect team. But because there was no hub, I often didn't know where to go for the things I wanted. For example, Delibird Presence has different items in stock depending on the city, so you can't always go to the most convenient one. A chancy Supply at the start of the game only has battle items like X Attack and Bitter Medicine like Energy Root, and since I don't use those kinds of items, I dismissed it as a store, and I didn't realize until looking it up in the post game that it's where you can buy mints and ability capsules. Off the top of my head right now, I have no idea where to go for hyper training or rental teams in Scarlet and Violet. I could look it up, but that's an additional step that creates a barrier where there didn't need to be one. Whereas Sword and Shield set me up nicely to try ranked battles, Scarlet and Violet did not. 
I still have not tried them in this generation, even though VGC looks pretty fun from what I've watched. It wasn't the only reason. Another important one was how you needed to grind through raids to accumulate enough Terra Shards to change a Terra type, and I just didn't find raids engaging enough to repeat so often. But the lack of a hub felt like a big loss to me. I know nothing I've discussed is part of the game's core. They're all superficial or supplemental. I don't think Shigeru Omori, the director, really thought something like, you know, a sparkle effect on shiny Pokemon conflicts with the themes of this game. Let's remove it. At least I hope not. But they are all things that can make it much harder to access and enjoy the meat of the game. The gameplay, the characters, the story, that kind of thing. We are slowly digging our way into that core. However, there's one more layer we need to get through first, one that is technically still superficial, but that was definitely the subject of directorial decision making. The visual style. If you'll allow me to pull back for a moment, I need to talk about what makes Pokemon look like Pokemon to me. I made a video about that a while ago, so to be brief, I think HeartGold and SoulSilver are the games that most look like Pokemon. The graphics are soft and colorful, making the world look bright and friendly, which fits the themes of Pokemon. The world is blocky, heavily outlined and cel-shaded, calling back to Pokemon's origins as a Game Boy game. The characters and objects in the overworld are consistently proportioned for the chibi style, with even the following Pokemon being chibis. The only time the style shifts is when you go into battle, where you see characters straight on and they have anime proportions instead of being chibis. Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire came the closest to reaching that ideal style in 3D, and Let's Go is the most visually successful game on the Switch so far. However, as games and regions grew more extensive and open world, things started to go off the rails. The blocky landscapes are gone, the bold outlines have faded away, and cell shading has only returned in Legends Arceus. For several generations now, Pokemon has slowly abandoned more cartoony aspects of its visual identity in favor of an incrementally more realistic approach. Maybe realistic isn't the best term when games like The Last of Us are out there, but my point is that Pokemon is no longer the cartoon world that it used to be. I don't mean to suggest that games became more realistic because they became more open, or vice versa, but I think the difficulties of these two approaches compound each other and worsen both problems. Let's look at the landscapes first. In Sword and Shield, most interiors and static exteriors still look comfortable and friendly. A few areas are stunning, like the shrine at Slumbering Wild, but on the other hand you have the wild areas, which look barren and ugly with some obvious texturing. Isle of Armor and Crown Tundra improved the approach to the wild areas, making them much more lush, but they didn't add any carefully crafted, beautiful areas. The landscapes in Legends Arceus lean even more realistic and look incredibly harsh. The harshness was probably intentional and fits the games, and the lighting can look lovely, but again, there are starkly noticeable repeating textures that make it hard to enjoy the views. Paldea is like one big Isle of Armor. There is usually enough going on for it to not feel barren, but there are also no exceptional locations. There are a few places with fantastic geography. The whole area going up to Alfernada stands out to me, with the stone path and a huge cave on the one side, and incredible layered waterfalls on the other. But again, the poor texture work is stark. The natural lighting doesn't lend that elevating touch unless you get lucky at dawn or dusk. Nowhere will you see sunlight gently coming through the canopy like in Slumbering Wield. There aren't many truly ugly areas, and when there are it usually comes down to performance limitations, but the game's baseline is unimpressive and never beautiful. The landscapes have lost the character of their blocky, cartoony days, and the level of realism the games can achieve falls far, far short of what could make up for it. The rendering of characters follows less of a clear trend. It seems they are willing to experiment some more with the look of people and Pokemon, but as I see it, it is generally trending toward realism. Of all of the Switch games so far, only Legends Arceus had proper cell shading, only Sword and Shield had outlines and they were subtle, 
and textures have become increasingly more prominent from completely absent in Let's Go to very obvious in Scarlet and Violet. But I think the most glaring change is in the human characters since Scarlet and Violet moved towards more realistic proportions, especially in the faces. The humans in Scarlet and Violet seem to come from some bland western 3D animation, not in the character designs, but in their proportions and rendering style. New Pokemon Snap wasn't a main series game, but it fits in this discussion because it was another step in this overall trend toward realism in Pokemon games. New Snap looked beautiful. It's not the nostalgic, classic Pokemon style I loved, but it is a consistent and well-executed style. Even though, like Scarlet and Violet, it is much less cartoony than most Pokemon games, and it also doesn't reach that Last of Us like, peak of realism, it is much more successful at crafting the specific art style that it aims for. You don't see repeating textures, the scenes are lit with care. The key, of course, is New Snap was a relatively small game experienced entirely on rails, so everything about it could be carefully crafted. The realistic texturing, lighting, and scope of the world work well because you can only experience it from a specific route. If there's anything ugly or unfinished, your pod doesn't go there. Scarlet and Violet isn't like that. The stylistic approach is similar, but none of it feels carefully crafted. You could approach any given area from infinite directions, ensuring that every location looks equally good from all angles would be impossible. Because Scarlet and Violet is an open world, it is much more challenging to get that style they chose to that fully realized execution, and in turn, it ends up a visually disappointing game. If it had been more stylized, more cartoony, it might have been easier to do well. And if nothing else, it would have looked more unique. Okay, here's where we begin to look at the actual core elements of Scarlet and Violet, but we're sticking within the realm of art direction to start. Let's talk about the character designs. The human characters, frankly, I have no complaints about. Of the main characters, Professor Turo, Nemona, and Penny stand out. The Team Star leaders look fantastic, as do many of the school teachers like Jacques, Rifor, and Nurse Miriam. Kieran, Carmine, Briar, Perrin, and all of the Blueberry League Club members are top-notch character designs. The gym leaders are on par with other gym leaders in the series, with Larry being the obvious standout for how well he sells the salaryman look. The only two characters whose designs bother me are Poppy and Gita. With Poppy, it is partly because she looks like she belongs in the 1950s, but to be honest, it's mostly because she talks a big game and can't back it up. I think Gita looks fantastic in theory, but her eyes are just way too huge for her face, especially compared to most other humans in this game. A few others, like Perrin and Penny, also have very wide eyes, but slightly less so. Their eyes don't both pinch at the nose and warp around the skull the way Gita's do. As for the designs of the new Pokemon, they were very hit and miss for me. I have another video where I talk specifically about that, so I'll try to be brief. This generation has some fantastic Pokemon designs like Garganacle, Tinkaton, Clodsire, or any of the Treasures of Ruin. There are also a lot of Pokemon that to me don't fit with the Pokemon design philosophy, like Orthorm, Bombardier, Cerulege, or Goldango. Several Pokemon initially caught my attention, only to leave me disappointed with their evolution. For example, Bramblin evolving into Bramblegast, Finizen into Palafin, Varum into Revivroom, or Pommy into Pommont. Their choices regarding the Paradox Pokemon designs made both groups feel monotonous, especially the future Paradox Pokemon, which iterated on their modern counterparts in more predictable ways. Overall, this generation of Pokemon left me feeling underwhelmed. However, what truly dampened my experience was that many of the Pokemon designs I found most exciting only appeared late in the game. Chen Pao, for instance, is a design that I adore, but I didn't get the opportunity to include it in my team. I tend to bond with Pokemon through challenging battles, but I didn't get that opportunity with many of my favorite designs. This isn't necessarily an issue with the game design. I think it's mostly bad luck that my particular tastes align so poorly with the Pokemon available throughout the main game, but there also have been other generations where it was easy to find Pokemon I loved. The Hoenn, Unova, Alola, even Galar. Unfortunately, Paldea was not one of them. Let's talk about terrestrialization, the big defining gimmick of the Paldea region. In theory, I think it's a pretty interesting mechanic. 
Controlling your Pokemon's type adds a new dimension to Pokemon battles that can be used in many unique ways. I appreciate that almost every key opponent in the game uses Terra. I'll even credit the gym leaders for using Terra to turn Pokemon that aren't of their type specialty into their type specialty. That way they can have more variety in their moves without deviating on type. And Iono in particular uses a great pairing of Electric Terra with Levitate to get herself an ace with no weaknesses. The problem is that's about as far as the interesting uses of Tarsalization go. Even with the gym leaders, after I was caught off guard by Katie's bug-type Teddy Ursa, the surprise element was gone. Unless I'm forgetting something, every other character in the story uses a Terra type that matches one of their Pokémon's types. That can be used effectively too, like when Rika terrestrialized her Clawed Sire into a pure ground type, removing its weakness to my own Clawed Sire's Earthquake. Fair enough. But why are those two ways of using Terra, gym leaders getting Pokémon to match their specialty, and everyone else keeping one of their base types, why are they the only ways of using Terra the main story uses? Why couldn't a gym leader have a Pokémon of their specialty terrestrialize into a different type entirely, like if Grusha had a water type a Titan, for example? It is also frustratingly easy to predict which Pokémon the opponent will terrestrialize. It is always their ace, almost always saved as the last Pokémon they send out. No matter what Pokémon you have on the field or how the battle is going, Tulip is always going to terrestrialize Florges into a Psychic type, even if staying a Fairy type would be more advantageous. I'm especially bothered that Gita and Nimona don't have more nuanced uses of terrestrialization since they are the strongest characters you face throughout the main story. Outside of how the mechanic is used in story battles, I have to say I don't like how it looks. I don't find the crystal effect attractive, and I hate the Terra Jewels. They look so stupid. Maybe other people like them, but I cannot conceive of why anyone thought giving Pokémon silly hats was a good idea. It's also a little disappointing that there are no unique terraforms besides Ogrepan and Terrapagos. It's not that the mechanic calls for it, I just like Pokémon designs in general, and I think it would be interesting for some Pokémon to have unique forms based on their Terra type. But that's not a significant loss. Bring Mega back! <laughs> oh wait! <laughs> <laughs> The other defining feature of the Paldea region is the Academy. Its role in the world building of Paldea is fantastic, and I intend to explore it in more depth in the future. I love that the entryway is a giant library where you can read books that help fill in the world, but the way the Academy functions in the gameplay does not work for me. I appreciate that, unlike most previous games, Scarlet and Violet has a mechanism for teaching players how the game works in more depth than what the early game tutorials cover. But every time a Pokémon game tries to teach me something, I compare it to Earl's Pokémon Academy in Pokémon Stadium 2. Earl's Pokémon Academy was an incredibly detailed resource on the Pokémon mechanics of Generation 2. The library had several guides you could access at any time, and the classroom offered lectures, quizzes, and skill tests to help you learn everything from basic type matchups to move multipliers to the effects of weather. The lectures were detailed but easy to scroll past if you just wanted to the credit, the quiz sections were directly related to the lectures of the level you were on, and the skill tests ensured you understood the material by requiring that you win your battles in specific ways. For example, a skill test about type advantages would require that you win with super effective moves only. The Paldean Academy falls short on all of these aspects. The history course is the only one that saves itself. Outside of that, every lesson contains very little information. I learned maybe two or three things in total. Often the lessons aren't even relevant to the subject. Pokémon emotions are shoved into a course on foreign languages. For some reason, the art course covers Terra Jewels and the Ten Sites of Paldea. Worse, the lectures are given through dialogue, so they are a slog. The exams aren't too bad if you ignore that Salvatore asks for his own name twice, but there are no skill tests at all, not even in the battle course where they would have been most appropriate. But you know what made Earl's Academy really good? It was entirely optional. As far as I recall, you didn't even need to complete it to unlock Stadium Round 2. The classes at the Paldean Academy may seem optional, 
but they are required in order to complete the teacher's friendship stories. The teacher's friendship is a prerequisite before you can invite them to the Blueberry League Club. While technically all of this is optional, it's a lot of character interactions locked behind finishing the classwork. My first playthrough was in Violet, and I did all the classes as they became available. But when the DLC came out, I started a new file in Scarlet. I completely ignored the Academy as I played through the main game, the Teal Mask, and most of the Indigo Disc, but when I wanted to invite the teachers to the League Club, I realized I would need to get through all of the classes and the friendship stories first. I had very little else left to do, so I had to do them all at once. It was an awful chore. In the end, the interactions with the teachers at the club were fun, but not worth going through all of the classes all over again. Of course, I couldn't know that, but the Academy is not well suited for replays. That ties in well with how Scarlet and Violet approach the open world concept. This is probably the most complex topic to explore for this game because the nature of open world games is that every person's experience of it will be unique. For me, almost every advantage offered by the open world approach was countered or undermined by poor execution. Generally speaking, I don't think every game needs to be open world. Open world isn't inherently better than a more linear or limited approach. They're just different ways of telling a story and exploring a world, each with its own opportunities and challenges. I hope that this recent expansion of Pokemon games into more and more open formats doesn't become the thrust of the main series as a whole, and that we will get more streamlined games in the future. But that's not to say I don't want open world Pokemon games. Pokemon's themes of independence, exploration, and making your own way in the world are perfect for an open world game. In fact, the fifth video I ever made almost six years ago explored some ideas for how Pokemon could work in an open world format. The problem is that I had a tiny audience back then, so Game Freak must have missed that video. I will give them some credit. The beginning of the game is pretty good, especially the first time you play it. You get to do a decent level of character customization before you even begin. You're fairly quickly introduced to important characters, your starter Pokémon, battles, catching Pokémon, and even the game's main story when you meet Coridon or Miraidon. For simplicity, let's combine their names and call them Rhydon. Okay, no, let's call them Komi. Uh, Coridon, Miraidon, Komi. There are a few sections where the pacing could be tightened to make the whole beginning quicker, especially for replays. For example, I don't know why you can't run towards Nimona's house immediately, or why Komi walks so slowly through the Inlet Grotto, but soon you're free to explore South Province Area 1, which is reasonably expansive for a tutorial area. It has a good variety of Pokémon to catch and a decent number of trainers to face. After you begin the treasure hunt, the bigger issues start to show up. Throughout Paldea, the concentration and diversity of Pokémon are pretty good. You're rarely standing alone in an area with no Pokémon in sight, and you always have a good number of options for team building. They also do an excellent job of pairing Pokémon with landscapes in a way that makes sense and helps the biomes feel unique. But I have an issue with the distribution of Pokémon. In particular, I felt there weren't enough rare Pokémon. Since you can see Pokémon in the overworld, even Pokémon that spawn infrequently can be easy to spot, so I think the ideal solution would be to make hidden areas with unique spawns. Think of how Bagon in Ruby and Sapphire and Emerald was only found in one tiny cave at the back of Meteor Falls. Bagon's spawn rate inside that room was 25%, so it wasn't hard to encounter, but you had to go out of your way to find the room. It was an excellent reward for thorough exploration. In Paldea, the only similar case is the cave in Area Zero where Roaring Moon or Iron Valiant appear. It's easy to miss, and those Pokémon only spawn there, which is fantastic. But with the size of Paldea and the number of native Pokémon in the Pokédex, I'm disappointed there aren't more. What if Tinkatink only appeared in one specific ruin, or if Toad School grew in one hidden grove? The items you can find on the ground have a similar issue. Their concentration and variety are good, but they're not used in a way that rewards exploration. Most, if not all, of the items you can find respawn periodically, so they lose their value. Even TMs aren't that valuable anymore. Not only do they respawn, but you can also craft them yourself. You have to find them before you can craft them, but most also get unlocked just by defeating Team Star bosses. Before Black and White, finding a TM allowed you to teach a move once. 
It was rare and limited, so every TM you found was valuable. After Black and White, finding a TM gave you unlimited access to a move. It was permanent and flexible, so it was valuable. In both cases, they worked well as rewards for exploration. In Scarlet and Violet, TMs are not rare, limited, permanent, or flexible, so finding one on the ground usually doesn't feel like enough of a reward. Powerful moves are still nice to get. The only real reward for thorough exploration in Scarlet and Violet is the ominous stakes that unlock the treasures of Ruin. Those are great. The number you need to find is reasonable, the difficulty of finding them is nicely balanced, the only issue is that most can only be obtained later in the game since you need advanced abilities for Komi. That means most of the game does not reward thorough exploration. The exploration itself is pretty clunky too. After being able to jump and roll in Legends Arceus, it feels weird not to in Scarlet and Violet. Just jumping up small ledges would make it feel more natural. Instead, you have to rely on Komi's exploration abilities. The abilities themselves and the way they slowly unlock more and more of the map for you to explore are fine, but pinning all of your traversal on Komi is a significant missed opportunity. I think Game Freak intended for the player to bond with Komi through riding it, but that didn't work for me. I bonded with it through cutscenes, but when riding it, Komi was more like an ATV than a friend. In a game that wanted to emphasize freedom and exploration, I felt the absence of the freedom to explore with whatever Pokémon I wanted. Riding Pokémon, not just one Pokémon or a predetermined set of Pokémon, but any Pokémon on your team that could reasonably carry you, is a necessity in an open world game. I also felt the absence of ways to interact with the environment. All we get besides traversal is knocking Pokémon out of trees by crashing into them. We used to be able to have our Pokémon smash rocks, push boulders, or cut trees that were in our way. Where did that go? I don't need precisely those to come back, but I do want to have obstacles that my Pokémon can help me overcome. Physical obstacles, not battles. And not just a ledge or a river, but a blocked route, a dark forest, rough waters, or even dense fog. It feels a little weird to have another game where you can have Pokémon outside of their Pokéballs, but have so little for them to do. Picking up items is nice, but it felt more tangible when Pokémon helped you directly harvest materials in Legends Arceus. Passive battling is a neat idea, but the generic fighting animation does not help my immersion. It's wild to me that even with the Synchro Machine, Pokémon still have so little they can do. They can't jump or climb, and flying Pokémon can't control their elevation. Since we're on this topic, let me just quickly say that this is now the fourth game on the Switch with following Pokémon, and Let's Go is still the one that did it best. I don't understand why they don't adjust the walking speeds of Pokémon so they can keep up and stay in the frame. Auto battle doesn't work for me either. The passive experience is nice, but I find it hard to predict which Pokémon will be battled and which will be ignored. Plus, you can miss moves or evolutions when you level up by auto battle, which is a pain in the ass. I wish we still had manual evolution like in Legends Arceus. And while the Synchro Machine is a lot of fun, I wish the player character would follow the Pokémon where possible instead of standing in place. It would be nice to use outside of the Terrarium, too. Anyway, back to the issues with how Scarlet and Violet handle the open world. Like with Pokémon and items, the number of trainers and non-player characters is pretty good, even when you're outside of towns and cities. That said, with so many trainers and so much space between them, finding the ones you haven't battled can be difficult. It would have been helpful to have a Versus Seeker type of device to locate, battle, and eventually rematch trainers. I often missed out on prizes from the League officials because I didn't find all the trainers. Trainers and NPCs have pretty limited dialogue, but I appreciate how many of them provide valuable information that helps to fill out the world building or guide your adventure in some way. But again, Finding the ones you haven't spoken to can be a challenge. Maybe there could be some kind of indicator that a character has information you haven't heard yet. The real disappointment, though, is that none of them offer any side quests. The side quests, or requests, were a fantastic addition in Pokémon Legends Arceus. They helped give the NPCs more individual character, guide your exploration of the world, and generally give you things to do and different ways to break up the rhythm of your adventure. In fact, the lack of things to do is a pretty glaring problem in Scarlet and Violet. You have three different primary storylines to follow, but when you're not doing those, 
you're just left to catch Pokemon, raise your team, or I suppose make your way to the next objective. The cities of Paldea feel strangely empty, and I don't mean empty of people. Most towns in Paldea don't have any unique attractions. Well, many of them have unique landmarks, like the observatory in Alfernada, the maze in Artisan, and the waterfalls in Cascarafa, but those are things to see more than they are things to do or experience. Is this to see or to eat? <laughs> <laughs> I'll include that joke for the Brazilians watching. Every town or city should have at least one major attraction, a special location, a unique service, or a significant plot point. Think of the towns in Kanto, for example. Pallet has Oak's Lab, Viridian has the Trainer School and the Mysterious Closed Gym, Pewter has the Museum, Cerulean has the Rocket Break-In and Cerulean Cave, Vermilion has the SSN, Lavender has the Pokemon Tower, Celadon has the Department Store and the Game Corner, Saffron has the Sylph Headquarters, Fuchsia has the Safari Zone, and Cinnabar has the Cinnabar Lab and the Burned Mansion. Every location offered something different from the standard fare of Pokemon Center, Mart, and Gym, and I didn't even mention them all. In Paldea, I can think of the Academy in Mesa Gosa, the Market in Porto Marinada, and the Treasure Eatery in Medali. You could count ESB in Alfernada, but that's pushing it. Zapapico and Los Platos only have a Pokemon Center. I can give Los Platos a bit of a pass because it is the tutorial town, so the Pokemon Center really is the important attraction, but it would have been nice to have something, even just a minor service like a name writer. No, not someone to change Pokemon nicknames for you, but someone to comment on the nicknames that you give. Something like that. But Zapapico? There is nothing there, not even one interesting shop. The NPC who trades you the Charcadet armor doesn't count. That's just a person standing there. They don't add to the character or the memorability of the town. What's weird is that almost every town has a battlefield, but it goes completely unused in towns that don't have a gym, like Zapapico. Why not put a powerful trainer there who can be battled once a day? I wouldn't call that an attraction, but it would have brought a little livelihood into the towns. The shops play a part here too, Almost every store, restaurant, or food stall in Paldea is a chain, so you're never surprised by what the town has to offer. Even the trainer customization issue crops up here. In Kalos, Alola, and Galar, some towns have clothing boutiques with unique offerings, so every time you arrive somewhere new, there's that excitement of, am I going to find a cool new item to wear? Because in Paldea you're limited to accessorizing, that can't happen as much. I went into every store hoping to find something cool, and usually, I was offered gloves. There are more issues with the open world, but what's left will fit better into discussions of specific storylines, so let's talk about those. The stories were generally outstanding, with solid characters and decent plots, but there were many issues with their gameplay, often because they were trying to make the open world work. Let's start with Victory Road. It's a straightforward story. Nemona loves Pokemon battles and pushes you to try the gym challenge. She is already a champion, but she starts the game with a new team to parallel yours. You raise your team, become stronger, conquer the gym challenge, and eventually surpass Nemona herself. The plot is minimal, but that's okay. This is only one of the stories in the game, and the sports movie approach is fitting. This storyline works pretty well in the open world format. You can battle gyms in any order, and you'll meet other characters like Rika, Hassel, and Nemona when you reach certain milestones rather than when you reach specific gyms. That shows how different characters are slowly growing an interest in you as you prove yourself. It also means that the battles against Nimona always happen at appropriate times, with her team's level more or less matching yours, regardless of the order in which you take on the gems. Unfortunately, that's the closest thing we have to proper level scaling. You can challenge the eight gems in any order, but the leader's teams aren't adjusted based on your progress. That means you risk taking on a challenge beyond your means, something that I enjoy. I like being underleveled and trying to find winning strategies anyway, but it also means you can end up so overpowered the gym loses all challenge. I also find a lot of things confusing about the gym challenge. For example, what is the purpose of the gym building? You go there to check in, they send you somewhere else for the gym test, you go back there to check in for the gym battle, and again, they send you somewhere else. If neither the test venue nor the battlefield are in this building, what is? 
What are all these other floors for? Affordable housing. Oh, that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> and why are we still doing gym tests? I know we all miss gym puzzles, but if these tests are what we get, I would rather have no preface at all. Most gym tests are insultingly easy. The only exceptions are Kaskarafa, which is framed as a plot point, and Medali, which actually takes some thought. Still, if the point of the gym test in the world building is that it checks whether you are ready for the gym later, how does it test that? How does my ability to find Sunflora or gently slide down a hill relate to my battle prowess? Where did all the gym trainers go? The same applies to the championship assessment. What is the point of those interview questions? What does it matter how I arrived at the league building? When I first played it, I thought the question about which gym leader gave you the most trouble had an actual role. I had the most trouble with Larry, and he was the third Elite Four, so I thought my answer had unknowingly selected my opponent. But no, that was a coincidence. They were overworking the overworked Larry joke. I should have known a changeable Elite Four member was too good to be true. Gita is a disappointing champion, her team is poorly formulated, but we all know the real final boss is Nemona, and I had a great time battling her. I wish we'd had a real choice of where to fight her, but seeing all those people we'd met throughout our journey coming together to watch us battle it out in Mesagosa was awesome. The battle was fantastic, it was one of the most exciting, fun, and challenging fights in the game. I lost the first time, which is always a good sign. And then, when I did defeat her, Nimona's attitude about it was perfect. She's so happy to see you reach your potential. I love Nimona. My favorite of the three stories was Starfall Street. At least the main characters and the themes of the story were my favorites, it is far from a perfect story. The first impression we get of Team Star isn't great, and Nimona and Clavel talk about them as if they were a group of troublemakers. But when Cassiopeia hacks into my phone, not calls me, hacks into my phone to ask for help to dismantle the team, I'm not exactly thrilled. Cassiopeia, I don't know why you want to destroy Team Star. You may have good reasons, but right now, I don't want to be on your side. Of course, I don't have a choice. The game likes to pretend that you have choices, like where to have your championship match against Nimona, or whether to accept Arvin's and Cassiopeia's requests for help, but it's an illusion. You can set a storyline aside if you want, but you will have to follow through sooner or later. So eventually, I go to one of the star bases. Director Clavel shows up, disguised as Clive, a charade that most people who know what he looks like would be able to see through. A bit ridiculous, but it is genuinely funny, and a good dose of dramatic irony never hurt anyone. I think the interactions you have with Cassiopeia and Clive before each base, and the ones you have with Penny after, don't depend on the order of bases, but the ones you have with the bosses themselves obviously do, so you get some information in a different order. I ended up going to Mela's base first, and right away it was obvious that Team Star is not what everyone thinks. In the flashback, Eri says Mela puts on a tough attitude to keep people from picking on her. Clavel's expectations of what Team Star is about, based entirely on rumors, is flatly denied by Mela, and although Cassiopeia is acting to dismantle Team Star, they seem to care for them. This immediately put me on the back foot. Even without knowing what happened, who Cassiopeia was, or why they wanted to take down the team, I felt they were making a mistake. I would have told them if the game gave me a chance. I was intrigued and got very quickly invested in the story. Slowly, you find out that all the bosses of Team Star were bullied. They found in each other the acceptance that they did not find at the Academy at large. They even brought other people into their community, and eventually they confronted their bullies. It's awkward that the story of Team Star is told almost entirely through info dump and flashbacks rather than through action. But still, I related to it. I was also bullied, I also found a community outside of school, and I also lashed out at my bullies. So for me, the impetus that kept me going through the story was not wanting to take down Team Star, but wanting to really understand the characters and what had happened. The last starbase I went to was Ortega's, where you meet Harrington and get the full story. That was also where the already clunky storytelling fell apart for me. I went through the entire story eager to know more, to uncover the mystery of what had really happened to Team Star, but it turned out that it was nothing. 
Some people got scared, but Team Star never really did anything. I did worse than them. It was an underwhelming revelation. I think that's the point. Team Star have been reviled because of the fallout of their big plans, to the point that you and Clavel expect that something big happened, when it didn't. So underwhelming is appropriate. But I was only battling these people because the game made me. Honestly, I would have preferred to join them. So finding out that I did all of that, I compromised my values, ultimately for nothing, did not feel good. Except it wasn't really nothing, right? Something big did happen. The bullying situation was so bad that the students felt the need to stand up for themselves with a big show of strength. And nobody in the staff or faculty noticed? They are the ones responsible for the students. Nobody tried to help the kids being bullied? As far as I'm concerned, the villains of the Team Star story are the academy faculty who didn't pay enough attention to their students to notice, the staff, in particular the administrator who destroyed the records of the event, and Director Harrington, who was in charge through all of it. All those people failed the students, and then failed them again when they resigned. Because nobody who actually knew anything about the Team Star situation stuck around, the rumors were allowed to spread unchecked. There we have another problem with this story. The people responsible don't face consequences, at least not as part of the story. Harrington is the only one we meet, the only one who is even named. Starfall Street would have been a much more satisfying story if it had been about Harrington trying to understand the students rather than Clavel. It could have been about him having the realization that things were not good, noticing that disciplining the students and sending Cassiopeia away hadn't helped Team Star reintegrate, and therefore making an effort to understand what was missing and do right by his students. Harrington at least seems to be making some small effort to redeem himself by tutoring Ortega, but ultimately the only one working to make amends is Director Clavel. And that's what makes Starfall Street a gratifying story in the end. Although Harrington doesn't have an arc, the Academy does in the figure of Clavel. The final scene after Cassia Penny has been defeated and Team Star is reunited is absolutely heartwarming. I can't respect Clavel's disguise, but I wholly respect his handling of Team Star. However, the story leaves a loose thread. Why were those grunts harassing Penny at the beginning? Why does Grunt A say that they have to meet a sign-up quota? The most generous interpretation I can come up with is that Team Star's reputation for being troublemakers has attracted the wrong crowd and kind of poisoned the group. But I see no other evidence in the game to support that. It is the only time you see Team Star members being aggressive away from their bases, and the five bosses give no sign that they are actively trying to increase membership. The whole point of Team Star is to be a welcoming home for people who just want to do their own thing. A membership quota makes no sense, and to me it reads like just another instance of clunky storytelling. The story of Team Star is a powerful one, of found families and misunderstood outcasts. I love what it stands for, but it is not successfully told. The use of expository dialogue rather than direct action makes the story fragmented, robbing the protagonism of the Team Star bosses to instead focus on Clive and the player doing detective work. It also makes the story distant, robbing the impact of the most important points of the story, particularly the confrontation with the bullies. The decision to have the redemption arc executed by a character that didn't need redemption robs that arc of its strength. Starfall Street is a good story, and it is almost a great story, but it should not have been in this game. It deserves to have its own spotlight. There's one small thing I noticed when reviewing the story for this script that is bothering me. Ortega clearly built the Starmobile on top of Revavroom and Varoom, but Giacomo and Mela say that they were designed to be powered by Charcadet. And then Mela says that she evolved a whole bunch of Charcadet to power the Starmobile, but Cerulege and Armorouge are not part of the Starmobile design, and Mela only adds one Armorouge to her rematch team. How did that work? And what happened to all the others? I realize now that I've gone this entire time without talking about the gameplay aspects of Starfall Street. Uh, the most unique is the Star Barrage. I appreciate the attempt to make a challenge based on auto battles, but frankly, it falls flat. I think throughout all five bases, I only had to heal my Pokémon once. 
It just didn't challenge me in any way. And with all five bases having basically the same process, there's no surprise to it. The boss battles, however, were another story. First of all, the battle theme is fantastic. Like with Victory Road, the ability to take on challenges out of order has its advantages and disadvantages. I didn't know the correct order of bases, so I took on Mela first, then Atticus, Giacomo, Eri, and finally Ortega. Mela, Atticus, and Eri all trounced me multiple times before I had trained up enough to take them on. The fights with Mela in particular were fantastic because I had no idea what to expect. But then again, I had outleveled Giacomo and Ortega before I reached them. I still got to listen to the theme, so I didn't mind too much. Plus, the Starmobile not really being Pokémon meant I was never quite comfortable in those fights. I couldn't rely on some of my trusty tactics like using Salt Cure to whittle away at a tough opponent or Spore to shut them down. Not knowing what abilities they had or what moves they might throw at me kept me on my toes. The battle with Clavel was great too, a more normal encounter, but I still lost in my first attempt. Strangely, the only disappointing boss fight was Penny herself, the big boss of Team Star. Maybe I just happened to have counters for all her team members, but without the Starmobile gimmick, Penny just didn't pose the same threat as the others. Yeah, it's like when her team is entirely EV illusions, it's not difficult to exploit the weaknesses. Yeah. yeah. But they're cute though. Very cute. Path of Legends ends up being part one of the game's big overarching story, but I had trouble getting into it. Arvin and I don't get off on the right foot. At the first meeting, he comes off as mean and arrogant, and when we find him again at the cafeteria, he's all buddy-buddy. I knew something was going on with him since before our first battle, he said memories were leaving a bad taste in his mouth, but I found his personality off-putting. To make things worse, he asked for help finding Herba Mystica to make health food, which is fine, but not something I'm interested in. Still, I agree to help him because I want to battle the Titans. After we defeat Cloth and collect the Herba, we get to see more of Arvin's genuine personality, which is nice and helps me to start to warm up to him. It's still pretty clear he's not being completely open with me, but after we defeat Bombardier, we get more of the story. We find out that he's doing this to help Mabostiv and that he's on his last hope. His reaction when he sees that the Herba are having an effect is lovely, and that was when I became invested in his story. I know Arvin had an awful childhood, the kid desperately needs some therapy, but I would have been on board with helping him much sooner if I'd known that he was doing all of this for his sick dog. I thought he just wanted recipes. Something that always annoys me in less linear games is when you have an objective to get to, but you take your time doing other tasks, and when you finally go to the objective, another character happens to show up right on cue. I hate how convenient that is, it just doesn't feel natural. Unfortunately, every Titan encounter goes like that. When you're in the Titan's vicinity, Arvin calls you as if he knows that you're there, and then he always joins you between the two battles against the Titan. It wouldn't bother me as much if this happened once, but all five Titan encounters go the same way. I wouldn't even need to change much for it to feel more natural. I would still have Arvin call you when you're in the vicinity, but he would have found the Titan already. After all, he's the one dedicated to looking for them, and their locations are marked on your map, so there's not much mystery to finding them. So he would call and say, hey, I found the Titan, are you close? Come and give me a hand with this battle when you get a chance. Then, no matter how long it takes you to get to him, it makes sense that he's already there waiting for you. You battle the Titan together, it runs away to eat its herbs, you chase it and challenge it together again. To me, that's a much better sequence of events. That said, I wouldn't have that be the sequence every single time. Path of Legends has the same problem as Starfall Street in that all challenges are very samey. The only Titan that felt unique was the last one, when you defeat Don Dozo the second time and discover that the real Titan was Tatsugiri. I liked that, but would have loved to see even more variety. When I battled Cloth, I found that Arvin joining the fight for the second half took away all the challenge. My immediate reaction was that I didn't want him to be there for every Titan. However, after realizing that the Titans were the checkpoints I needed to unlock Komi's abilities, I decided to pursue them immediately. It made sense to give myself more freedom to explore before I got too far into the game. And in that case, Arvin's help became necessary. 
I was trailing on levels, especially against Iron Treads and Dondozo and Tatsugiri, but Arvin's Pokémon always had appropriate levels and valuable moves. I still had to face the Titan by myself the first time, which preserved a level of challenge for me, and thank Knacklestack for Salt Cure, or I would not have gotten through the last three. But Arvin's assistance made it possible for me to defeat them even though I was nearly 30 levels behind when battling Tatsugiri. The flip side is that with all the extra levels my team gained by facing the Titans, I was overleveled when I returned to the normal course of gameplay. Thankfully, I had two teams on rotation, so I still had some Pokémon who weren't too far ahead. It is funny that I had to leave Arvin waiting for me to catch up to his levels for so long, but I got there eventually and we ventured into Area Zero for The Way Home, the closing chapter of the game's main story. Do you see Spider-Man? No, they didn't have a way home. Aww. <laughs> the premise was that the professor needed our help with the final step of their research, and they promised it would be an experience worth treasuring. We recruited Nimona to help us handle the powerful and rare Pokémon we expected to face in the Great Crater, Penny to help us navigate the advanced technology of the labs, Arvin wanted to confront his parent, and of course the player was the group leader. I don't know why the Zero Gate has an elevator that doesn't go all the way down the crater, but I admit that the scene where we all nearly fall to our deaths is pretty fun. Coming back into my body after a near-death experience and hearing the beautiful, bizarre, and unsettling theme of Area Zero is perfect. As we make our way down into the crater, our companions have fantastic interactions that help fill in their backstories, and it's all ruined by auto-advancing text that goes by too quickly to read. This is one of those situations where voice acting would have made an enormous difference! We meet Paradox Pokémon slowly at first, which is a little disappointing since it makes Area Zero feel less exotic than it was made out to be, but it's understandable. At each lab, there is a digital lock we need to disable, but all it takes is the press of a button. We recruited Penny to deal with the technology, but all she does is turn the lights on at Zero Gate. I appreciate that she is part of the crew, but the way things play out, she didn't need to be here. It would have been much better if Penny had to hack into the lab security system to disengage the locks. The labs also give us more exposition and a better understanding of the situation, including reasons to believe the professor isn't being completely honest. By the time we reach Zero Lab, I don't know what we'll find, and perhaps it's good that Arvin isn't with us to get the shock of finding out that the professor has been replaced by a life model decoy. Professor Al is a pretty interesting character. They were built to copy the original Professor perfectly, including having their memories, but they show independence and diversion in a few places. Once Al was built, it was no longer the same person, and their disagreements with the original Professor show how volatile opinions can be, swayed by very small differences in experience. But Al knows it isn't in complete control of its actions, and you have to face it in the most interesting battle in the game, backed by another banger of a battle theme. The battle isn't just challenging because Al has a team of Paradox Pokémon which all have exceptional base stats, high levels, and powerful moves. This battle is unique because about half of the Pokémon are not Pokémon you can encounter before the fight. It can also be tough to tell a Paradox Pokémon's types just by looking at it, so you are necessarily trying to figure out what you're up against during the fight. If you lose the battle, you can study the Pokédex before jumping back in, but you can't do that the first time. Well, at least not without looking it up on Cerebi. The final battle against the Paradise Protection Protocol and Komi is even more exciting. I know the battle is rigged so that you can't lose, Komi will tough out any moves that would knock it out, but you don't know that when you're playing for the first time. The framing of the battle and how the first few rounds play out make you feel like an underdog, like a win is impossible, yet you pull it off anyway. Scripted or not, the battle is thrilling. And at the end, the moment when Al decides it needs to go through the time machine, both to shut it down and to fulfill its own dreams, and Arvin realizes that he's not getting the kind of closure he was looking for, it is heart-wrenching. It is both heartwarming and heartbreaking. In all, The Way Home is a fantastic ending. As flawed as the storytelling is throughout the game, they brought it home with a solid finish, and the gameplay is there to support it too. My main complaint about it is thematic. 
I see a mismatch caused by separating the game into two versions. On the one hand, you have Scarlet, where Professor Sada is obsessed with Pokémon from the past, so she builds a futuristic AI and time travel technology to bring them back. Reviving extinct creatures, especially ones that went extinct because of human activity, is actively discussed in our world, so that objective is understandable even if you disagree. But if she researches past Pokémon, it doesn't make much sense that she would have the expertise to build the futuristic tech. On the other hand, in Violet, Turo is obsessed with Pokémon from the future. It still doesn't follow that he would know how to build the tech, but at least it matches thematically. In compensation, his objective of bringing future Pokémon to the present is baffling. Those creatures will have their time one day. There is no human influence to try to make up for. Ultimately, it isn't a big deal, the things just feel messier than they should. The Hidden Treasure of Area Zero DLC brings us one more storyline which is told in three parts. It is largely independent of the main game story, but also builds on and contrasts some of its themes and plot points. You can access the first part of the Teal Mask as soon as the treasure hunt begins. In my brand new Scarlet file, I went to Kitakami before doing any gyms. I appreciate how this can change some of the experience of the game as a whole, like giving you access to different Pokémon early on, but it made the progression through the story a bit clumsy. The Kitakami plotline is a reasonably tight and self-contained story, it seems made for you to play all in sequence, but later parts of the story have significant power hikes that make it prohibitive to complete without tackling some gems first. If you go there too early, you will need to break up the story, or grind a lot, and risk being way overleveled for the rest of the game. That said, the story itself is good. Kieran both admires his sister Carmine for her battling skill, and resents her for being so bossy and overbearing. He naturally gravitates towards the player character, who also exhibits battle prowess while being much nicer. But Kieran is obsessed with Ogrepan, so when the player gets to meet Ogrepan before he does, and then, following Carmine's lead, lies about it and hides Ogrepan from Kieran, he becomes predictably angry. I love how the soundtrack uses a shattering sound effect to highlight Kieran's emotional crisis. He unwittingly revives the Loyal Three, but he joins the effort to repair Ogrepan's image with the villagers. So when at the end he sees Ogrepan pick the player to be its partner, Kieran breaks. He retreats into his antisocial tendencies, resents the player, and nurtures a killer competitive need to prove himself. The only problem with the story is that I had to go along with it! No matter what Carmine thought, I did not want to exclude Kieran. I wanted to be the friend he thought I was and tell him all about our meeting with Ogrepan, include him in our interactions with Ogrepan. But the game didn't give me that choice. The game forced me to be an asshole. The second part of the DLC story, the Indigo Disc, can only be accessed after completing The Way Home, so it can't influence the main game. We arrive at Blueberry Academy to discover that Kieran is now reigning champion of their league club, pushing himself and every club member to become stronger at all costs. He is so set on being the best that he's jeopardizing his friendships. After the player rises through the club ranks and ultimately defeats Kieran, he feels humiliated and like nothing he can do is good enough. Still hoping to prove himself, Kieran joins Carmine and the player in Briar's expedition to Area Zero. He frees Terrapagos, but of course, it imprints on the player. So when Kieran sees another Pokémon picking the player over him, he uses a Master Ball. I was surprised and glad that he did, more so that it worked, even for a little while. I can't understand why Terrapagos goes berserk when it terrestrializes, though. While most of the Hidden Treasure story is well-constructed, this key plot point feels arbitrary. It's not like Terrapagos can't terrestrialize safely in other circumstances. Regardless, Terrapagos seems determined to collapse the cave, even destroying Kieran's Master Ball. This leads Kieran to blame himself, feeling completely useless. The player and Carmine attempt to fend off Terrapagos, but it's only when Kieran joins the fight that victory becomes possible. In this moment, Kieran realizes his relentless pursuit of strength has put everyone in danger, sparking the beginning of his healing journey. It's a pretty good way to wrap up Kieran's story. Things never go his way, but in his darkest moment, in his most profound crisis, 
Kieran manages to turn things around and bring himself back. Kieran sees the error of his obsession. But you know who never does? Briar. Kieran blames himself for Terrapagos, but Briar encouraged him to pull out the crystal and terrestrialize Terrapagos. She barely seems to register that her student is in distress. Her obsession with Heath and Area Zero brings the Blueberry crew to the crater in the first place. She put her students at risk, and just like Harrington and the Paldean Academy staff, she doesn't face any consequences. Nobody even comments on her reckless behavior! The story is tied up with Mochi Mayhem, a brief epilogue that felt like it wanted to be a Halloween special even though it was released in January. It mostly involves a lot of shenanigans with characters doing funny dances and challenging you to unexpected battles. Still, you get to see some of Kieran's character development through it all. Nemona battles Kieran as soon as they meet, and defeats him before you can even catch up to them. Kieran looks like he was hit by a truck, but he doesn't seem particularly upset about his loss. Throughout the epilogue, he seems to make an effort to rebuild the friendship you had at the beginning of the Teal Mask. When Nimona turns on you, Kieran agrees to hold back the crowd while you face her rather than trying to get a rematch. And when it comes time to battle and catch Petrant, Kieran is your cheerleader, pushing you through the fight and encouraging you to catch it rather than wanting a rare and powerful Pokémon for himself. It shows a lot of growth, and it is lovely to see Kieran making up with Carmine and soon befriending Penny, Nimona, and Arvin. While I was pretty happy with the plot and characters of the hidden treasure of Area Zero overall, other aspects of the DLC didn't work so well for me. Unlike how the Isle of Armor expanded on the concept of a wild area and improved on their execution, Kitakami and Blueberry are just more of what we had in Paldea. There are some unique and exciting geographical features, many cool caves in both areas, but they don't offer any innovations over the Paldean landscape. That said, I appreciated that both Kitakami and Blueberry Academy had unique personalities to their landscapes and local culture. The DLC's gameplay was also just more of the same. In Kitakami, there are plenty of good, tough battles, both against trainers and against boss Pokémon. Still, the only element of gameplay that feels unique is the Blood Moon Ursa Luna quest with Perrin. The photography part isn't much, but the battle against Ursa Luna is incredibly tough, especially when you don't know its stats or ability. It took me several tries to defeat it. In the Indigo Disc, the Elite Trials are all more interesting than the Gym Tests, but the decision to make the flight controls inverted by default is awful. I especially liked Drayton's Trial, which required a team of Terrarium Pokémon when I had only bothered to catch two Pokémon at that point. The battles against the Elite Four were all solid. I loved that the Elite Four teams didn't adhere strictly to their type specialties. Lacey gave me a lot of trouble. I loved how all the trainer battles at Bloomberg Academy were doubles. That by itself makes battling more exciting. Besides that, every other gameplay element introduced in the Blueberry Academy involved grinding. I hate grinding! Let me quickly define what I mean by grinding, just in case we're not on the same page. Grinding is any task I have to do repeatedly, not because I enjoy the task, but because I need the rewards that it gives. Any reward you only get by completing specific tasks, especially if it's something you'll want to accumulate, risks turning that task into a grind. Doing a bunch of meaningless wild battles to gain levels is a grind. Auto-battling hordes of Pokémon just to collect their mortal remains is a grind. Doing raids just to farm for Terra Shards is a grind. Doing any Blueberry quests just for Blueberry points is a grind. And everything you might want to accomplish in Blueberry Academy requires you to collect BP. It is awful. You can collect some BP passively on your own, and that is enough to at least progress through the story, but if you want to upgrade the item printer, invite all the special coaches, or unlock anything else through the support board, and you don't want to waste your life doing meaningless busy work, you will need to join forces with friends. Okay, that didn't come out right, but it highlights a critical issue with how Pokémon approaches multiplayer, particularly in this game. Blueberry quests are a chore. But rather than giving us a fun way to accumulate BP, Pokémon offloads the responsibility of creating fun to your friends. Here's something boring and repetitive you need to do, but hey, at least you can do it with friends! And yes, I enjoyed hanging out with my friends while doing BBQs, but I would have enjoyed it more if we weren't doing BBQs. There are more fun things we can do together. 
Even simple co-op exploration had a similar issue. You can't progress through the story in co-op, and the exploration itself is not well rewarded, so you're left to shiny hunt outbreaks or challenge raids. Shiny hunting, well, some people like it, but I lose patience very quickly, so I rarely seek it out. Having a friend around can make it much more tolerable, but again, that's not making the activity itself fun. As for raids, well, they're okay. I appreciate their attempts to make raids more fluid and dynamic than Dynamax raids were. Dynamax raids could be pretty slow, but Terra raids, in my experience, turned out to be buggy and hard to follow. I didn't have much fun with them. The last time I joined a raid was for Walking Wake and Iron Leaves. Well, and a few for BBQs. I am curious about the 7-star raid events for Mighty Pokémon, but I haven't tried them. From what I've seen, they can take some serious team building and strategy, which I appreciate, but it also keeps me from joining in. Preparing those Pokémon, especially when you need good IVs or specific EV spreads, is another grind I don't want to do. The best multiplayer activity in Scarlet and Violet was Ogre Ousting. The first few levels were easy, but the later levels were tense and exciting. Completing them took a lot of coordination, strategy, and even luck. When my friends and I finally beat the final level, the feeling of accomplishment was fantastic. But even so, Ogre Ousting wasn't perfect. For one, even though the minigame can be fun, I never played it again after I got the shiny Munchlax reward. You can enjoy it a reasonable amount alone, but it is impossible to advance beyond the level 4 or 5. You need friends to tackle the later levels, which is a barrier for some people. Whether it's because they don't know anyone who is also playing the game, because they don't feel comfortable in semi-competitive situations, or because they have poor internet access and can't connect with their friends, those people will not be able to get the most out of Ogre Ousting, even if they wanted to. I think Dynamax Adventures was the best cooperative multiplayer experience in Pokémon's recent history. You could do pretty well on your own, but you could take on Endless Mode with friends. You did need to complete Dynamax Adventures to get Dynite Ore, and you could use it for hunting for shiny Pokémon, so it could be a little grindy, but it was just the right amount of challenging to be fun even when you weren't going for those rewards. Unfortunately, Scarlet and Violet doesn't offer any multiplayer experiences of that caliber. Looking at Scarlet and Violet as a whole, I see a few overarching themes. For example, there are multiple instances of irresponsible adults putting children at risk. This is not an uncommon theme in Pokémon, but usually the culprits are the antagonists like Team Rocket, Team Plasma, or Lusamine. Scarlet and Violet incorporates this theme without having any antagonists, strictly speaking. Director Harrington and the Academy staff failed to protect their students from bullying, and then resigned rather than trying to remediate it. The professor's obsessive research caused them to abandon Arvin, even though they seemed to care for the kid. Briar somehow managed to do both. Her obsessive research leads to her putting her students in danger. As always, it's up to the kids to sort out the mistakes of their elders, with the very welcome exception of Clavel putting in the work to bring Team Star back into Academy life. I love how Pokémon has been moving away from stories with clear antagonists, instead telling much more complex stories, but still holding on to its thematic cornerstones. Another theme is the danger of overindulging in an obsession and letting it get the best of you. Again, this isn't a theme unique to Scarlet and Violet. Lusamine comes to mind again, but this time we have a lot of different examples. Sada, Turo, and Briar are so hyper-focused on their research that they endanger those close to them, Petrant's obsession with pleasing its humans causes generational trouble for the people of Kitakami. Kieran is an interesting case. His initial obsession with Ogre Pun is replaced with an obsession with strength, when Carmine and the player essentially take Ogre Pun away from him. He seems predisposed to want to get stronger, but the betrayal and abandonment turn it into an obsession. His search for strength is not simply out of a desire to be the best, the way it seems to be with Blue, for example. Kieran thinks that becoming stronger and defeating the player will make him worthy of love. That's why he feels so desolate when he loses control of Terrapagos, and why just a bit of encouragement is enough to bring him back from the brink. His recovery takes time, but he gets on a good path. There's also an interesting contrast with Nemona. She also has an obsession, but her approach to it is primarily positive. Her focus is on competition and self-improvement, not on the end result of reaching the top. Sometimes she doesn't notice that people don't like losing to her repeatedly, so maybe it compromises some relationships. Still, Nimona just wants to have fun. She wants everyone to have fun. That's why she's so excited that she lost, 
even when she went all out against the player. However, the central theme of Scarlet and Violet is that things are not always as they seem. A misunderstanding or deliberate deception is a crucial plot point in every major storyline except for Victory Road. Nimona is the only significant character who is completely honest about her intentions right off the bat. Team Star's bad reputation results from a massive misunderstanding about Operation Star. The team is initially framed as villains, but we eventually find out they are simply misunderstood. Penny hides her identity and deceives the player to manipulate us into dismantling Team Star for her. Even Clavel, in choosing to don the wig of Clive, uses deception to gain the trust of Team Star. Arvin's story also begins with a small deception, as he doesn't immediately share his true motivations for seeking out the Herba Mystica. It ends with a much bigger deception when we discover that the Professor has been dead for years, and their AI double has continued their research and even impersonated the Professor to keep up appearances. To this day, we don't have clarity on whether the Time Machine is truly a Time Machine or a Dream Machine. The entire region of Kitakami is gripped by an ancient misunderstanding, framing the Loyal Three as its heroes and Ogrepan as its outcast villain, when Ogrepan was the one defending the village from Petrarant's retainers. Kieran's arc is also kicked off by deception. When Carmine and the player aren't honest with him, he grows suspicious and then angry when he finds them out. The theme is reflected in the Pokémon themselves. Wiglet and Toadskull are completely unrelated to Diglett and Tentacool, despite looking so similar. The Paradox Pokémon closely resemble Pokémon they are not. At this point, we can't even be sure that they are ancient ancestors and futuristic descendants of modern Pokémon. Maybe that is a deception too. In a minor sense, the Terrarium fits the bill since it's an underwater dome made to seem outdoors. In a broader sense, the game itself can be seen as a deception. It appears to be an open world game, but it is secretly linear. You do have a lot of freedom to explore the landscape, and aside from Starfall Street, the stories are told in ways that work well whether you follow the correct order of checkpoints or not. But there shouldn't be a correct order of checkpoints! Scarlet and Violet lets you complete your objectives in any order you like, but the game isn't optimized for that. If you look at what levels your opponents have, you see there is an ideal order to challenge them in. As much freedom as the game seems to give you, the underlying game design is strictly linear. I understand that there is a significant challenge to open-world level design, particularly in a game like Pokémon where your power levels depend much more on the level of your Pokémon than on your skill as a player. But I don't get the sense from Scarlet and Violet that Game Freak even tried to adapt how they design games to work better in an open world. They created the same kinds of checkpoints they always have, but scattered them over an open map. The game makes no effort to maintain a consistent level of challenge as you progress, not even in the most basic level scaling. In my case, that created some fantastic moments when I took on trainers that were more powerful than I could easily handle but in turn, it also allowed for frustratingly easy matches. And this was without me ever going out of my way to gain levels. Like I said earlier, I avoid grinding as much as possible. If you are free to choose the order in which you complete your objectives, but there is a correct or ideal order to do them, are you really free to choose? If the game doesn't respond to your choices, are you really making a choice? Or is it all just another smokescreen? Scarlet and Violet is riddled with false choices. Penny, Nimona, and Arvin make a big stink about the player being allowed to decide what they do, but the game doesn't let you choose. You must complete all three quests to reach the end of the game. You have to become a champion even if you don't particularly care for gyms. You have to help Arvin collect Herba Mystica even if his spish sounds uninteresting. You have to dismantle Team Star even if it compromises your values. You have to exclude Kieran. How often does the game give you the options yes and also yes? Scarlet and Violet does not offer choices. It offers illusions. Okay, I've spoken enough. We've been recording all day and who knows how long this video will be. I think I've gotten my point across. I sincerely hope that the next Pokemon games, uh, Legends, ZA, and whatever comes after, can recover my faith in Pokemon games. You know, cautiously optimistic. Thank you for watching. If you disagree with any of my points, feel free to leave a comment so we can hash it out. If you enjoyed this review, please leave me a tip on Ko-fi to help offset the costs of making it. As always, I want to thank all of the Libros who support me, and everyone who has supported me in the past. 
This is actually the last video we will be recording in this set. We're about to move. By the time you see this, we will have moved already. The next time you see a video from me, things will look a little different. I'll see you in the next chapter.